1964, the story of My Fair Lady was adapted to the silver screen. It became one of the biggest grossing films. It was the biggest grossing film for that year. Now, I wasn't born yet, but my brothers were. They're twins, and, you know, some of you might remember this movie, even though it came out after you were born, but I know there's a few of you in this that might remember it. But it was the story of a woman of, well, considered lower stature in London society, a cockney flower seller. This man enters into her area, and he is betting with another man that he could change the course of her direction if only he could teach her how to speak proper English. Now, do we have any British in here? Ooh, thank God. <laughs> no, just kidding. I, honestly, I cannot understand what some British people say. Have you been, encountered this? My daughters were playing, you got all the time, right? <laughs> My daughters had these, these flown-in coaches come to coach soccer. They called it British Soccer Camp. And these guys, they were just like teaching the girls, and, and some of the words that came out of their mouth, it just wasn't English, I swear. And they were like bouncing the ball, like from their foot to here, and they would say, foot, foot, fi, fi. And I'm like, what's a fi? I don't understand. So anyway, this woman in the movie, Eliza Doolittle, she's taken by this idea of what could be if only she could adapt her behavior, her mode of speech, and change her phonetics. She could be presentable in high society. She could be accepted in areas where right now she was looked down upon. So she pursues this with that man, and he begins to train her. And one of the most famous lines is her repeating some phonetic exercise. The rain in Spain falls mainly what? You've seen it. Stories like this are, are pretty much popular. Because in ourselves, we all kind of sense that there's some inadequacy or the world has an advantage over us and we want to find our edge. And we think if only we could modify some behavior or some trait or some aspect about ourselves, then we could get one over on the world. Stories like this are repetitive. I mean, if you look at Bollywood movies, it's just one after another of the same thing, right? It's somebody of a lower stature finding themselves in a different. But we have them in America and in other countries as well. How about Trading Places? Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd, anybody seen that one? Pretty Woman. Julia Roberts, Richard Gere. For you younger folks, The Princess Diaries. Anybody seen that one? I have three girls. I've seen it <laughs> over and over again, right? The Blind Side, a little more subtle and, and not as clearly depicted, but same kind of issue. Typically, the stories begin with the recognition of what ought not be. It's clearly portrayed. There is a, uh, something that shouldn't be, and then it's followed by a progression toward what ought to be. But where does that sense of ought and ought not come from? Usually there's an initial extension of grace toward the one who needs to live up to their potential. But we often struggle wrapping our minds around grace. Grace is something that's given freely. We didn't earn it. It didn't. There was nothing about us that demanded that it come our way. Grace is a gift, and it's given. And when that takes place, we struggle with it because we more want to identify with the system of works being a self-made man or a self-made woman, that we did it. But it's a fallacy. Nobody's self-made. Everybody is dependent upon everybody else. But when we can't live in society properly, everything begins to fall apart. 
Often the rub in these stories is the feeling of disparity between one's sense of identity and the one that they're trying to assume. There's something inside that says that there's, it's not gelling. It's not who I am. And we, in our, in, even in our pain, even in our struggles, we find ourselves repeating some things or going into certain behaviors or, or reliving or recreating things that are harmful because they're familiar, they're comfortable. Even the negative traits, they cause pain, but yet we are more comfortable with the pain and the familiar than what could be. But even many of us have tried and tried to change our behavior, to modify some aspect of ourselves, to make ourselves more palatable to others, to be received and accepted, or to find that edge in life. You know what? We're, we're all the same. We all recognize one, we didn't bring ourselves to this planet. We all wonder what's on the other side of death. And we recognize we live in a context of not our choosing. We were dropped into it. We wonder if we have the ability to choose and create a path forward for ourselves, or are we merely just playing out somebody else's game and we're merely pawns on that chessboard? We have a need to find a way forward, norms to live by, ones that lead to life and not to destruction or death. And this is what we want to find. Many philosophies, many ideas abound around the world on how this could be. We try some on, like clothing, and we find, oh, they're not fitting, or this is painful. I've had those jeans. They, we won't go there. We find our own limitations. We want a way beyond. We want to find the greater potential and promise. Then somebody speaks to us about Jesus. They introduce us to him. An invitation comes, and we have the opportunity to step out of our current circumstance into an almost unbelievable opportunity because people are talking about do-over. I mean, how many do-overs do you get in life? Not a whole lot. And often what people say is a do-over is a makeover. It's not a do-over. We want a do-over because sometimes we want to set things right and start again. But we have no way to rewind and bring it back and play it out. But God, he has a way. And so today we're picking up in our series as we walk through the book of Ephesians. Today we're in chapter 4, and in the first three chapters, Paul, in his writing, takes us in this high view of everything. It's like a 30,000-foot view looking down upon the world, upon life, looking at God's plan for the world and for us as individuals. In chapter 1, and, and you've noticed if you've been here through this series, I've been utilizing movies unintentionally, but it happens. It's like I'm trying to connect ideas with you, and this stuff's working. So it wasn't my thought or plan ahead of time that we would go through a movie series, but it's just kind of working out that way. But I'm not going to give it away. If you haven't seen the first video or been here on week one, you need to go look at that because I'm not going to tell you about the movie that's talked about. You'll have to see for yourself. But Paul focuses in chapter one on the riches that are available to us that we need that have been there all along and we were not aware of them or we are aware of them but we're not utilizing them. And the riches come from who God says we are so that we'll live like we should and who and what God has provided for us. But then in chapter 2, Paul takes it a different angle, and he begins to contrast light and dark, and he shows us what, who we are apart from God. And the answer was simple. We were dead. Spiritually dead. Maybe alive in body, but we were dead. 
And with death, it's dark, and there's no hope, and there's nothing beyond, and that's just that. And apart from Christ, we're dead. He talks with Nicodemus in John chapter 3 about being born again, and Nicodemus is trying to wrap his mind around returning to the womb, and, and Jesus is like, you're Israel's teacher. Why don't you understand this stuff? Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. You must be born again. So if we want to be alive, we have to be made alive, and that is by accepting Jesus and following him. We believe in him, and then we find light. But the contrast helps us to see. This is the old knob that's on the back of an old black and white TV like I used to have. Contrast helps you see things because they differentiate light from dark, one thing from another. And that produces the vertical hold. In chapter 3, Paul details God's big picture and how we can stand secure in God's love. But now in chapter 4, we're halfway through the book, and Paul begins to pivot away from this telescope view, looking down from 30,000 feet to a closer, more personal and practical application of our walking with Christ. He moves from theory to practice. But this is the area that we find most comfortable with because all the time we want to know, oh, just skip all that stuff and just tell me what I need to do. I just want to do this stuff. But in Paul's mind, being pre precedes doing. Understanding theory goes before practice. We want to do because we want to have that self-made system where we just do things. But doing things doesn't produce the life that we need. We can do all of the Christian practice, do all of the devotional practices, do all the stuff, but if our heart's not changed or rightly inclined toward God, we will not change, nor will we be different. We will have just modified behavior. That's it. But it doesn't lead to life. It doesn't lead to hope. In the form typical of Paul's letters, doctrine comes before duty because how we live flows from who we are. Let's begin in, in verse 1 of chapter 4. It says, As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul's instructions are a move away from self-focus. We can't help it. We're kind of wired this way. We think about ourselves and we satisfy ourselves and we try to pursue everything for our own benefit and pleasure and it's destructive. And when we come to Christ, he starts moving us away from being self-centered to being Christ-centered. It's like that, that clay that's thrown down onto a potter's wheel. When it smacks the wheel, it is self-centered, but it is running on the wheel, and it's an elliptical orbit that's rough. It's a hard ride. Until the clay centers in the wheel, then and only then can it be built up and shaped into what the potter has intended for it to be. When we're centered on ourself, life's rough. The ride is rough. Paul is moving us away from self-focus. He says in verse 1, he says, a life worthy of the calling. Well, what is that calling? And that calling is that we are called to be part of God's family. We are adopted into his family. And like I have said previously, if you are adopted, you are chosen. You are wanted. Not everyone born into a family, born into a family is wanted. Oftentimes, parents will share, oh, we, you were a surprise. We really weren't planning for you. You were an accident. And so we think, gosh, how does that impact my sense of self-worth and value? 
But when you're adopted, you're chosen, you're wanted, and God adopts us into his family. But his family is different than any family. His family is royalty. And so we go back to those movies that I was talking about, like Princess Diaries and My Fair Lady and all these other things, and we think, gosh, how could I be a part of something like that? Because I know who I am, and I know where I came from. And yet God, in his infinite wisdom, being all-knowing, chooses us knowing the intricacies of our inner workings. And he wants us. How could that be? It's amazing. Often adopted children have to adapt to their new identity as a family member, and it's a great privilege to be a part of God's family. But we have to believe that we should be a part of it, and that's sometimes difficult, especially if we see ourselves in a different light than what he sees we should be and could be. In verse 2, Paul talks about being completely humble. And what that means is consistently humble, not occasionally. This is the virtue. If you want to do something, pursue humility. It is the one that won't be talked about in sermons much. It, there won't be a sermon on humility almost ever. But the worst of sin is pride. And every other sin is attached to pride, but the reciprocal is humility. And the way to life is to find that. And it is an elusive virtue because when you're thinking about humility, you're thinking of self-application, and then you start assessing yourself either as, I don't need that because I'm way up here, or I'm a worm and I'm way down here. But both instances, you're thinking of yourself. And True humility is nailed when you forget to think about it, when you're self-forgetful and you're focused on others. Only then you've nailed it. I'm proud to say that I've got a whole collection of books on humility sitting on my shelf. In verse 3, he says that there should be unity of, of the Spirit Unity in God's family. Unity is highly valued and must be maintained. Do we understand what division is? Of course you do. You live in this planet. You know what it is to have problems with people, for there to be chemistry issues. You just don't like certain people, and it's just something about around their eyes. It just irritates you, right? Or that voice, oh, can't stand that person. Why do they even talk? We have issues, and people think those things about us, and we think, what's not to like, <laughs> right? The amazing thing is in God, in Christ, we who are varied, and I'm looking at a crowd of varied people from varied places of differing colors and accents and styles and abilities, and, but we're one if we're in Christ, and the thing that's most interesting is how we are one. We shouldn't be, because there should be so many reasons why we shouldn't be together and united, and yet somehow we are because of what Christ has done in us. But we should maintain the unity by making it a priority. The more we have God in us, though, this is the priority order. You put God first. You let him work through you. And the closer you get to God, the closer you get to those that are pursuing God as well. And we become one. And then we fulfill God's prayer for us. Bearing with one another, it says in verse 2. This is tolerance. Now, the definition of tolerance has changed. In fact, we find that many of the definitions of the words that we knew are changing. Tolerance used to mean, I put up with you. I don't agree with you, I don't believe the same way, I don't see this the same as you, but I'm not going to make a fool of myself and be a jerk because of our disagreement. I will tolerate that. Now tolerance means we have to agree. That's not how the word was originally used. 
But when we bear with one another in love, we are remembering that we are all people in process. We are being sanctified. We are being changed. We are being made in the image of Christ. And we're all at different points on a spectrum of getting closer to that. This is a lifelong thing that we're walking out as we become like him. Everybody's in a different spot. Some people are rougher around the edges, but if we all recognize that we ourselves are in this process and they too are in this process, then we tolerate things that should not be because we believe that some changes are going to take place over a course of time and they will get closer to Christ and they will be, start modeling his image. They will be like him. In verse, verses 4 to 6, there was a repetitive use of the word one. One, one, one body, one spirit, one, one, one. And this is Paul emphasizing that all the things that used to divide us before should no longer be sources of division now in Christ. Here's my first point. God wants you to quit living for yourself. Why? Why? It's destructive. When you're living for number one and you're looking out for that same, you are on a path of destruction and you just got pain in front of you. That's it. That's your choice. If that's where you're heading, how's that working for you? God wants you to change that. Live for him and for others and to become self-forgetful. You're called to be a part of his family, if you will, it's something so much bigger than who you are as an individual. Let's continue. In verse 7, it says this. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Now here, Paul is paraphrasing and interpreting a line from Psalm 68 to show how we are all one in God's big plan. But each is endowed with uniquenesses that contribute to his plan. In verse 7, he says, grace apportioned. Here, Paul is saying that in addition to the grace of unmerited salvation, we're also giving abilities, gifts, that are unique but complementary to the needs of the body of Christ. Verse 8, he uses the word gifts. Gifts, God-given abilities that contribute to building and maintaining God's family. See, here it is. God's gift is through you, not to you. If you're wondering what your gifts are and you haven't, well, one, you've got to First, start with Christ. Trust in him as Lord and Savior. But then, if you're trying to figure out what it is he's wired you like for his purposes, then you have to do stuff because the gift is not for you. It's for everybody else. But it's worked through you. Pastor J.D. Greer, who Kelly Just has put me on to through his ministry to the youth, He's pretty cool. I like him. He says that a spiritual gift is this. There's a, there's a diagram. It's the confluence of ability, the stuff that you're good at, and the affinity that you have, the things that you're passionate about, and the affirmation, what others recognize. It's in that Venn diagram kind of thing, that confluence of, of all those three things where that's your spiritual gift. And sometimes you see something happening in the church or around and you ask, why is nobody doing anything about this? Perhaps you are that somebody who should champion that need. In verse 9, he talks about ascended and descended. And the meaning of these words and phrases is uncertain. They have been hotly debated. Some think that ascended and descended mean one thing or another. But what really matters is how we debate with others, if we debate at all. How you handle disagreement says more about you than your stance on those issues. 
does descended mean to earth or does descended mean to hell? I don't, I'm not sure. And some are willing to dig in and fight, and in that they're forgetting the whole point of everything here. We maintain the unity on these debatable matters by not fighting over them. But we hold with conviction and firmness the matters that are crucial to our faith, those things that are non-negotiable. And there's a difference. Verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Again, in this verse, we are shown that we belong together. You cannot really be a follower of Jesus on your own. You cannot be an appropriate Christian if you just have some mere belief in God and you do your own thing. If you follow God, you follow him in the, his ways. His way is he built a family and intended for you to be a part of it. So you can't be a part of a family if you're just by yourself. But the family has to be built up. Various analogies are given through scripture. Family, body, we use the word core for body comes from corpus, many parts that make one whole. In this, in verse 11, Paul talks about five giftings, special giftings, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But these are unique for a purpose, and that purpose is the equipping of everybody else for the work of the ministry. And sometimes in Christendom, we've got this backward where we say we hired the man on the platform, he does the ministry, we come to spectate. But that's not what the scripture says. My job in my role in this five or four, depending on how you count it, is that I equip you. And that this is like our team huddle. Man, if you come up to me and you say, man, you called that play so good, it was awesome. You, nobody calls a play better than you. What does that mean? Run the play. Then we'll see. Run the play. In verse 12, he t says, his people, other versions say saints, and we get confused when we hear the word saints because we equate it with what some uh, denominations have said, uh, somebody who's dead and done miracles. Well, that's not really who Paul's writing to when he uses the word saints. He's talking about all of us who believe. And then in verse 12, he's talking about service so that. We don't just work to work. We have this whole... Uh, context of purpose that we work within and it's the building up of the body the body must be built up it must be strengthened and we are in verse 13 he says to attain maturity and fullness and this is one thing that I keep repeating message after message we are in process and we're pursuing maturity that's the goal when we're parents and we're trying to teach our kids, often we start off with don't do that and don't touch that. Stop that. Danger. And then we kid up, as they grow up, we start getting good at the word no. I mean, they come out with it at two or younger. No. And we're like, who, who are you saying no to? And then we start saying it. No. Hey, mom, can I borrow? No. Dad, can you loan me? No. Hey, I want to go. No. And we get good at it. And then they, suddenly they're 18 and they leave and we're like, what the heck? We forgot to mention a few things. We figured this out a little bit late, and so we apologize to our oldest daughter. <laughs> the goal all along is maturity. That's the goal of parenting is to raise adults 
that are responsible contributors to society and to have faith in Jesus. That's the goal. And so we should start saying that when they're younger, as they're growing up, you are going to be an adult one day. And when you're an adult, that means taking on responsibility because that's what maturity looks like. It's not about having fun and having a summer off and being, well, sorry, Danica, but anyway. <laughs> we take on responsibility, and that's what adulthood looks like. But it's some of the most rewarding things ever is when we take on responsibility and we see other people grow and develop. It's wonderful. When we live for ourselves. we never get to be a part of that because we're never investing in someone else. We're living for our own pleasure. But that's not how it was supposed to be. Verse 14, and I've got to move. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We need to not be infants. When you are born again, you are spiritually an infant. You may be 78 years old, but if you just come to Christ then, you are an infant. And there is a process of maturation that must take place. You must submit yourself to that process. You must pursue it yourself and have the help and assistance of the rest of the body of believers around you to help you get there so that you will not be an infant. An infant is dependent on others for their sustenance, but when you grow up, you feed yourself. Everybody claps. Yay. You clean up your own mess. Everybody claps. Whoop, whoop. And that's the process that we are going after. But when you're an infant, you're vulnerable. You can't protect yourself. You can't stand, and you certainly can't swim, and you can't deal with all of the cunningness and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. But when you mature, you see things as they are. God wants you to pursue maturity in Christ. I've said this before, and I'm going to keep saying it because that's important. If you're just showing up to check a church box that I've done that, check, check, well, good, there you go, you've done that. But you want to find life. You want to find how to live this life so as to not cause pain or to receive it. Right? And only as you apply the teachings do they have an effect. Just as important of knowing what to do is knowing what not to do. And then Paul takes that track with verse 17 onward. He says, he talks about attitudes and thinking. So in verse 17, he says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. He says the Gentiles, whereas before he was referring to them in chapter 1 as Gentiles, separated from the promises that Israel had. Now he's like the Gentiles, not meaning them. He's meaning everybody else because now they've been adopted, included into something, and they are now part of the promises. Not as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. Futility means you think one thing and it doesn't play out. It's wrong. They are darkened in their understanding. They, the, those that don't believe in Christ, and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, that means becoming calloused. I mean, you work in a kitchen and you keep touching pans, eventually your ability to touch pans increases because you grow calluses on your fingers. You can handle that. You can turn tortillas in a pan and not hurt. But our hearts can become calloused. 
and then we can't sense anything. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. Moving on to verse 20. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. You see, we're not born good. We're born evil, dead spiritually. And every inclination of our heart is to serve self at the expense of others. Every sin is connected to the fallen state of those original passions that God put us in us as depicted in Genesis chapter 1. But there's hope, and that's found in Jesus where things can be made new. You were taught to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Each day, we open up the closet or the drawer, and we stare at clothing, and we decide what to put on. Every day, hopefully. Many of you stood in front of your closets this morning debating which one? Hey, what are you wearing? Are we going to be matchy-matchy? Others of you looked in the dirty clothes bin and you picked something up and you sniffed it, <laughs> deciding if you could get away with it. Every day we decide what to put on and what we can get away with and what's comfortable or what's appropriate. We are to put off that old self, because you know what? That outfit really is unbecoming. It doesn't look good on you. You put on the old self and, and say, how do I look? Somebody tell them the truth, because it's not right. Be made new is a makeover in your attitude. We need to have the attitude of Christ Jesus. To put on that new self, this is a daily choice. And it's built on the understanding of who we are in Christ and how that is to look. Third point, Jesus wants you to become like him, a world changer. Part of something bigger than yourself, bringing hope to the planet and to people that are hopeless. To be an effective world changer, there are some prerequisite things that we need to keep in mind. And let's look at verse 25 to see what that is. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Here's the thing. Our old patterns of behavior produce predictable results. And if you keep repeating the same behaviors that lead to disastrous results, your expectation should be just what you've always gotten. In your anger, do not sin, verse 26 says, selfish anger is so out of style, righteous anger is in. Zeal for the Lord is in, and God will handle the whips. We don't have to pick any up. Do not let the devil get a foothold. Do not remain angry and resentful with people. Forgive, because you're not hurting them through your resentment. You're hurting yourself. Forgive quickly. Forgive often, even if they are a repeat offender over and over again. Forgive. Keep yourself free. Don't let the devil work his way into your heart, and that is done through resentment. And when you start claiming what should be for your own personal benefit, or that, you know, sometimes sin is sin. It's bad. It's harmful. It does hurt us. But so does resentment. So does letting the devil into our life. 
Verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We're coming to the close here. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Malice is where you're premeditating how you want to hurt somebody. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's the key to forgiveness, remembering what you have already received yourself in God's forgiveness. Have you received God's invitation into his family? To step out of your old life. It's funny about invitations. We get them from time to time. Old schools on paper, new styles emailed to us. Oftentimes there's an RSVP part. And a lot of times we'll get an invitation to some kid's graduation We'll get 14 of them at once. And what do we do? We kind of decorate the kitchen with them, either pinning them up to the refrigerator if you have that capability, putting them on something to remind you not to forget. Invitations are only as good as the response. We put invitations around, that doesn't equal a response. That's just we're aware. You've received a, an invitation. You're receiving it right now. If you haven't already responded, now's the time. Because here's the thing about invitations. They are about a particular time frame that does pass. And when it passes, it's over. And you can't return to repeat. It's gone. So have you received and acted upon the invitation to accept Jesus and to accept this faith. We don't know what it's going to look like when we go to the event. We don't know who actually is going to be there. We, there's a lot of unknown. But we take a step of faith by trusting that the one who invited us is trustworthy. And then we step out and we see. And have you been living for yourself? And how's that working for you? Let's reorient ourselves toward a better way. And have you entered into God's family yet, or do you still need your diapers changed? Are you still an infant? Showing up, checking a box, but not progressing to maturity. That's partially on us, but that's a lot on you. We're going to try to make sure that the pathways to maturity are very clear and understood, then your part is to respond to that. But this is not for while you're here at this church, this congregation, and we're talking about a lifelong process, no matter where God takes you. Or are you pursuing maturity in Christ? Are you becoming all that God has intended for you? Are you a contributor to the development of your new family? It all begins with that Point of being reborn in him and then from there it's a decision to grow let's pray father in heaven i'm grateful that you're also father right here that you're omnipresent lord i thank you for for loving us and for showing us that there's something beyond the difficulties of this life that there's hope beyond death and that there's a purpose for life, and it's just not random. That doesn't settle well in us, random, meaningless, pointless. God, I pray that you would stir every heart in here to see and believe that you have created all things, that life didn't just emerge out of nothingness, but not only did it emerge, and, it, and not only was everything created and formed, but it was formed with pattern and predictability and form 
by an intelligent design that was in, in, intent on bringing us life. God, we're grateful for Jesus who didn't just enter into this, this life coming from heaven, descending down to our level, but not condescending, becoming just like us, identifying with us and showing us that there's a way to live. Where works didn't work, Jesus, you offered us grace and hope and a future. God, I pray that each person in here today would decide to grab hold of that hope, that future, that could be. Because unlike the movies and unlike the stories of behavior modifications that don't really change the outcome, we need what only you can provide, and that is a transformation, a metamorphosis, becoming something that you've intended that we are not yet. That happens by being born again, by believing in Jesus. I pray that you would help each person to trust in you and to begin that process. And God, I pray that each one of us would continue on a path that's moving forward in a process of maturity that ends up becoming the hope of the world as we display Jesus through a body of believers who love each other and are united in that head. Bless us, Lord, today and help us to go with this perspective. Show us how to apply the things that we've heard in Scripture. Open it up to us, Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that we would be instruments of light in your hand, bringing hope to the world. In Jesus' name, amen.